Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. I have with me Yuri Dagan, who is in Moscow. He is a tech entrepreneur and longevity researcher who has recently come to my attention as someone who has done extensive work looking into the origins of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. And I was very impressed when I read his paper on Medium. I talked about it previously on the podcast with Heather, and so many of you have seen his work. What you may or may not know is that, especially this week, that work has shown up in a number of mainstream publications as uh, a... Uh, a strong bit of research pointing in the direction of at least not shutting down the laboratory origin hypothesis for the virus. So, Yuri, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so you and I have talked a number of times about what this virus looks like to us and why it is that we're having trouble uh, swallowing the official story that this virus clearly came from nature, perhaps through a wet market, uh, but that it has nothing to do with the two labs that study bat-borne coronaviruses in Wuhan, China. Um, so what I want to do is bring the fans of this podcast along a bit so that they can get the view from somebody who really does understand the biotech aspect of coronavirus research and uh, they can make a judgment for themselves based on real information rather than just uh, dueling personalities making claims. So I hope I can fill those shoes, but <laughs> thanks for the credit of you know knowledge. Well, I know you can fill those me? shoes. Uh, I <laughs> you know I think you don't fully believe that you are at an epicenter of history, but obviously the pandemic is a major historical event. In some ways, it is a singular historical event, and your work, uh, on you know, your work, which is you know not in the laboratory with coronaviruses, but your work revealing the patterns in that uh, that body of literature and what they suggest about what is possible and what we have to consider with respect to this pandemic. That work is um, the gold standard. You've really done a better job than anybody else surveying that literature and uh, pointing out what right. it implies. I mean, it really, uh, the, if there's one problem with it, it's that the work is so complex that I had to read your your paper twice in order to understand fully what you were saying. And I think for lay people, it's out of reach until we unpack it for them a bit. Um, but it really is very high quality work and you're courageous to have put it out. Well, thank you. I just, you know, disclaimer that I'm not a virologist by any stretch of imagination and I mean my knowledge of biology is uh, I think you know just at a level where I can just see genetic patterns and blast sequences and, and see differences or similarities and that that medium post post or medium article is, is nowhere like it's not a scientific paper and it's not meant to be it's meant to be just an overview of the things that virologists, virologists have been doing and the kind of research they've been doing and uh, and just my kind of ramblings about the things that I th would have thought could have pointed at a lab origin or natural origin and I was kind of sharing my, my journey uh, which took me from initially being extremely skeptical about the possibility of lab escape to being uh, much less skeptical and actually quite upset that so many established scientists just dismiss this as a conspiracy theory, which kind of le leads people like me initially who trust scientists, trust their opinion to just by association to do the same. And, and then, but actually when you look at the facts, I don't think we can be that, you know, sure that this is not a lab leak and uh, I think those viro virologists who claim that, you know, there's zero chance or virtually no chance of this being a lab escape are, uh, to put it mildly, uh, incorrect. Well, so. you know, you're, you're obviously um, bending over backwards not to say what I think is clear to both of us, which is 
we can't say that this is a lab leak, but we can say anybody who tells you for sure that it isn't is either very confused about the facts or not telling you what they know. And that that, you know, you're not a virologist, but uh, in a sense, that may be why you're able to play the role that you're playing. Something about the incentives that surround mainstream virology at the moment has caused the entire field to line up behind a story that is incorrect, that lab leak is not worth considering as a hypothesis. And um, as I've pointed out on the podcast before, that puts us in a very dangerous situation because at the moment when we have a global pandemic unfolding with a bat-derived coronavirus, the very people who need to be at the forefront of helping us understand what that means, what that implies about the, uh, the um, mechanisms at work in this virus, those people have all compromised themselves by telling us a fairy tale. So what I'd like to do is uh, unpack a little bit what the evidence does look like and what, what it doesn't yet tell us. So can you outline what the, um, the facts are that are most striking to you with respect to unpacking the, or with respect to sorting out what the most likely explanation is? Sure. Well, I mean, the biggest coincidence or big, the most striking thing is this happening in Wuhan, which is, uh, you know, ne next door to the lab that is like the number one lab in, in China, on coronaviruses, and this this in itself is a huge coincidence. This that hasn't been explained at all at this point, and which has puzzled many scientists, including Shi Zhang Li, the kind of the, the chief scientist in coronavirology. She's not the head of the Wuhan Institute, but she's like a probably number one leading scientist or the most recognized name in coronavirology in China. Um, and she herself was the kind of the number one person suspecting a lab leak out of her lab because uh, Wuhan is is a very odd place for a coronavirus leak to occur from like a bad coronavirus because, um, well, first of all, they don't really eat bats in, in Wuhan or Hubei uh, as, as opposed to like in the south of China where actually like Guangdong, where it's... It is partly cuisine. And I didn't know all this. Like to me, I, like when people were initially saying that this is odd, I thought, well, come on, it's a wet market. Yeah, it's like maybe a small chance of happening, but uh, I'm sure they, they had bets there. But when I actually looked at the evidence, when, and before I, I became skeptical of, of the uh, impossibility of the lab leak, I thought that you know it, it, it's not a not a big coincidence, but after looking at it, I realized that it is a huge coincidence, because and those bats that that carry those coronaviruses, they don't live in nowhere near Wuhan. They live you know two thousand kilometers away uh, in Yunnan, and any other other outbreaks of coronaviruses that like SARS or HKU one that happen that they happen in the, I guess the tropical climates. They so. Uh, and Wuhan is just very, very odd place for this to have occurred. It's, it's an odd place. It's also an odd time since those bats would have been hibernating. Uh, so yes, there are two, absolutely. two conspicuous facts that suggest something about the Wuhan origin is is odd. Right, and we we don't have any any other any explanation like natural origin explanation of how the virus could have gotten there. Like they scoured the uh, wet market and now even the official Chinese sources dismiss this uh, hypothesis that no, actually wet market is not the place of origin of the epidemic. And so it's just a huge question mark, which isn't in any way explained at this point. And, uh, and lab leak <laughs> explains it perfectly, you know? Yeah. So um, I think so. Uh, it would be worth pointing out that you and I had a parallel journey in this regard. You were initially researching uh, to basically uh, to buttress your argument that the lab leak hypothesis was an empty one. And as you delved, you discovered that it wasn't an empty hypothesis at all. For my part, I was in the Amazon with Heather, completely out of contact with the world. And we emerged from a very remote location, the Tipitini Biological Station, 
into uh, into we came out and went into the Andes for a couple of days, and we started to look at what was on the internet that we had missed, and there was a a story about this coronavirus circulating, and you know this was very early. This was in uh, in February, and um, I looked at it, and I'm a bat biologist, and I saw. Okay, there's a wet market. People are eating bats. This is a bat-borne coronavirus. The story looked very straightforward to me. And so I tweeted about it. And I said, you know, I haven't done a thorough look, but what I understand from the evidence here, this does look like a, uh, a, a virus that would have been in horseshoe bats and that it would have emerged through contact. And I said something about wet markets being dangerous, I think. And I immediately got back a number of replies that said, so you think it's a coincidence that it's in the same location as this, uh, you know, biosafety lab level four uh, that studies bat coronaviruses? And I immediately retracted my tweet and I said, there's obviously something about this story I don't understand because that's a huge coincidence. Um, And, you know, I initially thought maybe the facts wouldn't turn out to be what I thought they were. They would turn out you know, as you wondered, maybe these labs that study these viruses are really very common. And so it showing up in Wuhan isn't that special because if there are a thousand such labs or whatever, then okay, it it emerged near one of them. But no, this is one of the two most important labs in the world that studies these viruses. So anyway, that, that moment of waking up to these coincidences are too big to ignore, then leads you into the biology. And, and kind of one of the contrary points that was being made initially was that, well, of course they had the lab where the bats are. So, but then you actually examine it and realize, no, those bats don't live anywhere near the lab. They, they live thousands of kilometers away. And that, that, that alone was uh, enough to make you, you know, scratch your head and, and, and think maybe, you know, this, this is all to the story that people like virologists make it out to be. So, yeah. A lot of questions that uh, kind of led me down the rabbit hole. And after looking at the kind of research that has been going on in that lab and around the world, uh, the the lab leak hypothesis has become much more probable than, than initially thought. Yeah, the uh, I think the frightening thing to me, maybe the most frightening thing here, is that if you have the background that allows you to just even begin to look into the facts here and you don't have a dog in the fight you're not a virologist right or you're not signed up with a political team that's selling a particular story then you instantly end up in this rabbit hole where uh, all of the things that you're told about why you shouldn't pay any attention to that hypothesis turn out to be paper thin and then all of the things that might point in the direction of the lab turn out to be harder to dismiss than than you would like them to be. And so at the point you start talking to people about this, you discover that the resistance to this idea is not based in facts or logic. It is based in something else, but it is very strong. So have you encountered this? I, I don't know if I said at the top, you're in Moscow. You've been in right. Moscow for the whole duration of the pandemic? Yeah, I kind of got stuck in Moscow <laughs> once the flights got canceled and the borders closed. Uh, I'm sh- yeah, absolutely. I encoun- encountered it. And actually, I was a bit surprised that the strongest opposition to the idea that lab leak is possible, I got from the Russian scientific community. And people who also supposedly, you know, they don't have any dogs in this fight either. But to them, the very kind of thought of even considering that the scientists could be lying to them that was blasphemy and they you know were very harsh in their criticism that i'm just kind of peddling baseless conspiracy theories but when actually pressed for kind of a logical explanation why they think it's it's okay to dismiss a lab hypothesis Why, why do they believe so strongly that you know it's cannot possibly be a lab leak they don't really have any evidence or at least nothing strong like conclusive eventually it all ended up being dependent on the four percent difference between the sequence of genomic sequence of uh, SARS-2 and 
the nearest common ancestor, the RATG sequence, RATG13 that the Wuhan lab released. And it all kind of takes Wuhan at the word that this is the, the only sequence and the closest sequence they ever had and completely just trusts them and thinks that, you know, the, the, that's those people think, the Russian kind of critics think that that's the strongest evidence that this could not have happened inside a lab. Right, a sequence which that, is, that came from a lab that obviously has a tremendous amount at stake in the question of yeah, whether they are responsible. Absolutely. And, and it's a very suspicious way in which it was revealed and just those little half-truths about the sequence that were, were like revealed in a piecemeal fashion, like limited hangout fashion, that to this day haven't really been explained. Nobody has been pressing the Wuhan or Xi Li about the sequence, whereas there's so many questions about it. First and foremost being... Uh, why didn't why did she rename it, right? It and why didn't she mention in the two thousand you know twenty twenty paper? Why didn't she mention that she collected it in twenty thirteen from a mine in which six six people got SARS like pneumonia? Okay, and so it, my my <laughs> listeners are not going to have any idea what you're talking about yet. So let's let's put this story right. together so that they can follow it. So okay, well, let's do it. RATG thirteen is the name of the is the name of the individual from which the sample was collected. The individual uh, back. No, it's, or is it's it... the name. Of, it's actually the name of the strain. RA is uh, Rhinolophus affinis. I yeah, that's I'm right. Butchering. Latin. Yeah, Rhinolophus and... affinis, which is which is a horseshoe bat. Right. Um, it's the one of the like the horseshoe bats are like a big. Family and this yeah, one, Finnis is, yeah, is because uh, they have Sinicus as well. Is Sinicus bats, Rhinolophus Sinicus were the ones who had the first SARS, and that was the kind of the, the bat family that uh, 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 Xi Jinping initially specialized in. And Finnis is kind of the one that, like, uh, the one she initially dismissed, or at least she claims, but this is the one that, that harbored this strain. So RA is the, the bats, TG is Tong Guanzheng, or Tong Guan, or Tong Guanzheng is the place where the mine it was, that uh, the, the area in in Yunnan. And 13 is supposedly the year, the 2013, where they collected the sequence. That's okay, the, so the nomenclature. You've got a lab that specializes on bat coronaviruses, they are studying these mm -hmm. viruses, their, their grants and their papers point to the danger of a virus emerging from nature, they point to bats as a likely place for a coronavirus to come from on the basis that SARS, uh, the first SARS, SARS-CoV, uh, the initial one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, appears to have emerged from a bat, and so their point uh, at a scientific level was we need to study these viruses and how they might emerge so we can prevent a pandemic. Is that approximately right? Yeah. Okay. And they had grants for this for probably over a decade. Uh, they worked together with EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Daszak. We'll come back to him. You're heading that. Right. But uh, the, the story of, uh, let's get back to, yeah, to the story of the strain, the RATG strain. Uh, it wasn't originally named RATG13, and uh, in in 2020, it was only revealed that uh, uh, what the Wuhan Institute claimed that they fully sequenced it, and they said that when they collected it in 2013, they only sequenced a very short fragment of its RDRP gene, the uh, the polymerase gene that copies a virus, uh, which they was their standard practice to uh, determine. Pretty much the phylogeny of the virus. I'm what, sorry. I'm what, sorry to interrupt you. I want to go back to the to the um, to the sequence of events so that people can follow. In 2013, right. this mm -hmm. uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology lab that studies emergent coronaviruses because of the danger of a pandemic is looking right. in Yunnan province in a cave in a mine that has right. horseshoe bats, and they're looking there. Um, am I correct that there has been? A minor outbreak. There's a yes, minor outbreak this. of pneumonias. Right. Well, they had six miners having a minor outbreak. <laughs> <laughs> Good Excuse one. the puns. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> uh, and so they were invited. The Wuhan Institute was invited to investigate. The outbreak actually happened in 2012. 
And so they were invited in 2012, Xi Jiangli and Wuhan Institute and other some other virologists from other institutes from across China um, were invited to kind of look at the mine, look at the viruses that inhabit this mine. And uh, uh, they had, I think, four, three or four trips and they collected, extracted this one in 2013, probably the, the last trip of that four in, in, in that time span. And uh, by then, the three of the miners have died and they also analyzed four of the miners' samples. So the four surviving miners, two miners died right away, four miners were in the hospital and they had their blood samples, sputum samples collected and sent to the Wuhan uh, Institute of Virology on the advice of the uh, head ac academic in China responsible for SARS, uh, Dr. Uh, Zhang Nanshang. I, uh, I hope I'm not butchering his name. Uh, um, so uh, on his advice, they sequenced the miners' samples, uh, not sequenced, they checked the miners' blood samples against various viral antibodies, and antibodies for SARS, the first SARS, came up positive. They detected IgG SARS antibodies, which of course is hugely suspicious because the first SARS outbreak was pretty small in China. It was just about 5,000 people in mainland China. So the, the odds of having four miners in the same cave carrying antibodies from the first outbreak are like negligible. Most likely it's actually just SARS antibodies cross react with a close relative, another SARS-like strain, which, uh, you know, which Shei Jianli was on the hunt for for many years. And now we know that this, of course, the, the SARS-2 is a SARS-like strain, like it's close enough relative, the relative that there's a high chance of antibodies cross reacting the antibody tests for the first SARS cross-reacting with any kind of SARS-like antibodies that could have been produced when people are infected by, by uh, SARS-2 or RATG13 or any other similar strain that could have been in that cave. And so the fact that this was never mentioned, not like all of this uh, knowledge now about the four miners having SARS antibodies, about Wuhan Institute testing the miners' blood samples, is only been revealed in the past few weeks through like Twitter activists digging into Chinese PhD and master's thesis in Chinese that were never translated into English. And uh, so, you know, when, uh, when we kind of look at this, the story of Xi Jinping and Peter Daszak saying that when they discovered this bad strain in 2013, it was so uninteresting to them that they just put it in the freezer and never touched it until in 2020, just by sheer luck, they sequenced SARS-2 and, and saw a similarity to this little fragment they, they initially sequenced. That story kind of becomes uh, hard to believe, you know. I mean, you're, you're being um, generous. It, it, it does not <laughs> add up. The fact is right. you have a lab that has dedicated itself to studying SARS-like coronaviruses. They have right. happened on a cave in which humans have been infected, the first step in the pandemic sequence. Yes. And you've got these cross-reactive antibodies. So this is what they're looking for. And their story right. that they, at the time, regarded it as unimportant just simply holds no water. I would point out that there's another important piece of information here for people trying to understand why you and I and a few others have landed so far from the consensus perspective. One of the things that is maximally conspicuous to me is the virus that emerges in Wuhan is ready to go, right? It is it is adapted to human beings. There is no evidence of a phase in which it is fumbling about trying to discover the means to infect human cells well enough to become spreadable, right? No evidence of that. It hits the ground and boom. Now, the story from 2012-2013 in this cave, this mine in Yunnan, is indicative of something that must be true, which is... Actually, little jumps into human beings are not that uncommon. In general, no pandemic arises because they don't experiment successfully. The viruses don't experiment successfully and discover the key to infecting large numbers of humans. So people may get sick, they may die, 
or they may get sick and they get better. But the world doesn't end up knowing about these things because it's a tiny outbreak of pneumonias, and there are pneumonias all the time. So the fact of uh, the virus in Wuhan being so well adapted, the fact that we have evidence that viruses that are not especially well adapted do jump sometimes, and it doesn't turn into something that we notice at a historical level, these two things are really um, important. And then you have a, a laboratory behaving oddly with respect to the exact thing that they claim to be looking for. We know they were looking for it. We know that they were working on these things. And so now I want you to unpack, right. if you will, the oddness. So this is, again, something that you called my attention to. I never would have gotten there on my own. RATG13 is the strain that is revealed in 2020 after the pandemic begins or... Right. Late 2019? Yeah. Okay, so this is the strain. The, well, the... January 29th, I think, it was published by Xi Zhengli. Yeah. Okay, Pre so was. Xi Zhengli publishes a sequence. She says it's the closest thing we've got to the circulating uh, virus, the virus that's circulating in the human population. It comes from a sample we collected in 2013 in Yunnan, um, and we didn't think much of it at the time, but here it is. We've got it, uh, or we had it. Am I correct that they do not? Yeah, have... it, she just mentioned it in passing in like sh very short sentence. She never mentioned the mine. She never mentioned pneumonia. And it's a different name from the one that they had given it in 2013. And also they don't cite their original publication in which they revealed this, this uh, original short uh, sequence of this, this strain. They... Initially, they called it 4991, bad cough 491, which is just the number of the sample. And it's just odd that they decided to rename it and never mentioned the, like, the original strain. The, so actually, scientifically speaking, this is unacceptable. You would not rename a strain and not at least leave some pointer that explains why you renamed it and allows somebody to trace it. And I think people should actually look at your Twitter feed because they can see you as you're trying to sort out. You've got these uh, sequences that may in fact be the same strain under two different names, and you simply pose the question on Twitter, are these two the same, right? And it turns out that we now know that they are based on, uh, well, what is the Well, now like? they claim they are. It's, 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 I mean, there's some wild speculations that maybe maybe they just they couldn't bring themselves to claim they are the same thing because they just took the the 4991s the little fragment and they kind of worked around it <laughs> and put something uh closer to SARS-2 but maybe the the actual uh actual initial sequence is different or maybe it's uh, extracted out of the minor samples. There's like there's so many possibilities, and I agree there there are just you know wild conjecture at this point. But it's just very odd. Yeah, why would you know scientists not even mention, not even cite themselves their you know previous work where they collected it? They should get some you know additional accolades for it, and they just can't bring themselves to 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 mention this and remain quiet about it and still they haven't explained they just all that happened is in their internal database there's some big chinese database on on viruses all they did is they kind of added in the 4991 to the description of the ratg sequence just in brackets which kind of indicates that now they have uh, confirmed that it's indeed the same sequence that they collected in, in 2013 but there's been no official commentary and there's been no official explanation. And even, I think, in a follow-up pa paper, they still don't cite the 2016 paper by, by, by the, the, the Wuhan Institute authors, which just very odd behavior. So we've it's got... It's as if they're... Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's, I don't know. It's either they're un really uncomfortable with what they're doing or... Because, I mean, it's obvious that, you know, once they reveal it, people are, are going to arrive at the conclusion that it's the same sequence. I mean, it, the or, original uh, fragment, 4991, was submitted to GeneBank in 2013. It's not like it could be, you know, deleted from there. So it's very odd that, uh, you know, the way that they, they chose to, to, you know, disseminate this information to the public. So in some sense... 
uh, the odd relationship between sample 4991 and RATG13, the fact that they appear to be based on the same, uh, the same strain, are not identified as the same strain, it's hard to avoid the impression that this is functioning like two sets of books, where if you don't want somebody to be able to follow a trail, you could rename something so that it doesn't connect to the other things that would constitute evidence of what it really was. So I'm not saying that that happened, but I am saying it is very interesting that this lab is behaving in an, a scientifically uh, unorthodox, unacceptable, and if it's intentional, unethical way with respect to samples that are now uh, at the center of a historical pandemic. Whatever its source, we have a right to understand what it is that these samples are and what the relationship to each other is. And then you mentioned databases. Um, what has yes, been your experience that's... looking into these databases in order to figure out what connects to what? So there's another database, or there was another database by Xi Jinping herself, like her private, not private, personal database. It was public at the time, and she essentially collected uh, her own uh, little uh, viral samples or pasted some uh, little parts of the genome that she thought were, were interesting into this database rather than submit them to GeneBank or other databases. But so that database had been has been missing. It, it seems to have been deleted. It, the link, for the download link is no longer available. And also that database was kind of in the midst of a bit of a, not a scandal, but it was very interesting to see that on December 30th, Xi Jinli uh, kind of scrubbed the database of some mentions of arthropod vectors or like mosquitoes or, or uh, she changed those names to, not na those phrases, she changed to uh, bad coronaviruses. So initially it was a database of uh, potential wildlife coronaviruses and zoonotic interactions or actually host switching interactions and all those mentions were deleted and replaced by just bat and rodent coronaviruses, which, you know, a lot of people noticed that. And maybe at the time, whoever, well, it, it was done under Xi Jinping's idea, I think. Whoever was doing the changes probably didn't realize that there is a change tracking system in place where people, people can just go back to the previous version of the description and see the differences. And, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a minor thing. The major thing is that now the 60 megabyte database that was previously available for download is no longer there. You you know, the download link, if you click on it, you just get an empty archive back. And people have tried contacting the host, hosting provider of the database to, to check, you know, can we, was there a backup file? Can we you know, get it back online? And the response they got was uh, laughable that, oh, sorry, we didn't keep the backup. You know, it's they didn't keep yeah. the backup of these. How, how yeah, how yeah. things can be, you know, <laughs> which and I'm sure there's virology labs that probably have the, the backup because it was just one downloadable file. It's not that big, just 60 megs. And if they have it, it'd be great if they could share it. Because yeah, many people I'm will sure. have downloaded it, right? Many people will have downloaded yeah. it in the course of their work. I'm pretty sure that like yeah, the, the Barrick lab would have it because they, they've been working on a lot of the similar sequences it's great to to see you know what your competitor slash collaborator has you know to kind of maybe give you ideas on what they're working on see their recent submissions and i think that can give a good idea of, of the types of to a person skilled in art could give ideas of what research directions the competitor is following so i'm sure they were keeping tabs on on each other. So uh, yeah, if anybody has the database and they can share it, or at least check if there's any kind of odd sequences and maybe just, you know. No, no, pl prepare. please share the database with us if you have it. <laughs> um, this, this is important right. and it's, you know, uh, it would be great to um, check some hypotheses here, but really that database uh, is disproportionately valuable in light of the pandemic and what information it might contain. So you mentioned the Barrick Lab. This is Ralph Barrick in uh, North Carolina. Right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so Ralph Barrick is the uh, the PI in the other major coronavirus laboratory. He's in the U.S. He has collaborated with the the Zhangli Lab in China, 
uh, at times. Mm -hmm. They are also competitors. The, you know, this is the way science works. Um, so they're uh, friendly competitors who are constantly, as you point out in your Medium article, one-upping each other with respect to their uh, ability to manipulate viruses and things like this. Um, but anyway, the, it, this deserves to be on the table because um, the Barrick Lab has been uh, quiet, am I right, about these uh, abnormalities and coincidences? They have effectively signed on to the consensus that uh, a laboratory leak is so preposterous as to not worth, be worth our consideration? Well, I, I think there was just one brief mentioned by Ralph Barrick that lab leak is theoretically possible. So he personally, I don't think he said he can rule it out. That was a while back, but he, he never dove into the details. And one thing he said that uh, at this point, we still don't have any kind of evidence of a natural origin. We don't have a intermediate host. And uh, since then, I haven't really heard anything from Ralph. He was just, I, I just heard, I guess, a couple of podcasts with him on like virology, the virology podcasts this week in virology, I think. Okay. Um, well, that's better. But, I'm, I'm uh, glad to hear that he acknowledges that it's an open possibility at some level. I, I, I think so. I, I mean, I, uh, that's, I hope I'm rem remembering correctly that, I mean, I hope he actually goes on the record and, and says what he really thinks, because I don't think, yes, anybody has been quoting him verbatim about his stance on, on this being either a lab leak or an impossibility of a lab leak. So. Okay, so let's um we we've jumped around a little bit. We've got a massive coincidence in terms of the emergence of the virus. It emerging in Wuhan is suspicious. It emerging uh, at the end of the year in winter when the bats would have been hibernating is suspicious. Uh, even the Chinese government now acknowledges that the wet market is not the origin point. Um, we and don't it's not have... even a bat virus. It doesn't seem like the the receptor binding domain is is not optimized for bats. Uh, I'm not sure. Did it, did it did they try infecting bats with this the SARS two? In any case, so the RBM came from a pangolin virus, and that that's a whole now. Wait a second. Other... I want to <laughs> I want to correct you. The RBM did not come from a pangolin the closest sequence we have is from a pangolin. Am I right about that? It's not that we know that the RBM came from a pangolin. A pangolin well, has that... been offered as the likely intermediate because the sequence for it, so the, uh, the binding domain is this important sequence that creates the proteins that allow the SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral particles to invade cells, right? So it mm -hmm. binds the... Uh, the ACE um, uh, particle. Um, so am I correct? We don't know that this is from a pangolin, but we that's our best guess because of the sequence similarity. Well, the RBM is from a pangolin strain. The RBM is nowhere else to be found. That RBM is, is, is pretty unique. And so, and it's kind of been throwing a, a wrench into this phylogenetic uh, trees that because in all the respects, in all other parts of the sequence, RATG13 is the closest uh, relative of SARS-2. But in that very narrow strain of the spike protein, the RBM, the receptor binding domain, that is actually kind of the key to entry of the particular animal, because, you know, the ACE2 receptor is different in different animals. That came from, that came from a pangolin. And more, moreover, the more interesting part is that it actually binds to a human receptor better than it does to a pangolin receptor. So it seems a bit more optimized or adapted to, to humans than to pangolin, pangolins, although the strain is supposedly extracted from pangolins that were smuggled or captured by uh, Chinese customs from smugglers in Guangdong in 2019. And then they sent some samples to some labs, virology labs, because those pangolins died uh, of some pneumonia or something. So, so they suspected. I, I still think we need to sort this out. I think we are having a communication yeah. problem for some reason. The sequence is not 100% identical to the pangolin binding domain sequence. It's 99%. I mean, it's it's got like, uh, uh, I want to say, how many 
Is it 70 amino? Uh, it only has one amino acid difference in the receptor binding motif. There's a receptor binding domain and the receptor binding motif, the RBM. And that one has, you know, all but one amino acid identical to the pangolin strain NP789. And how big is uh-huh. the how how big is the uh, the motif? It's not that big. Uh, I, my memory, I mean, I think it's like seventy eight or seventy nine amino acids. So it's short. So one of them is different. Yeah, it's pretty short. The domain is is bigger. It's uh, I want to say I don't know maybe a couple hundred. You know? And how how um, what is the percentage similarity of the the whole domain? Well, the, the RBD, the domain, is actually very similar between the three strains, between the, the SARS-2, the pangolin, and the RATG-13, and uh, it's, it's pretty conserved between other, with other strains. But it's actually the, the RBM, is, it's different between SARS-2 and RATG-13, but it's nearly identical with just one amino acid difference between the pangolin strain and, and SARS-2. And the, the only thing is that it's identical on the amino acid level, but on the nucleotide level, there are some dissimilarities. And there's actually quite a lot of differences for some people to, to claim that, you know, it couldn't have been uh, uh, like a lab leak because it would have taken a lot, like for natural passaging of, of the two strains to have such a high difference in nucleotides, although the Amino acids are the same. The nucleotides have like a twelve percent difference. So you're talking it's about a short sequence. You're talking about what we call synonymous mutations, right? Right. Yes. So for those of uh, you who so- are uh, maybe grappling to remember your high school or college biology, because you have a triplet codon um, and you only have twenty amino acids that are possible to be specified, there's a lot of redundancy in the code. So you can make changes in the genetic code that don't change the sequence of the protein in question. And the protein in question is the important thing because that's what dictates how much affinity uh, this molecule has for uh, the cell receptor to which it is binding that allows the virus to gain access. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So when we're talking about how, how similar or how different, we have to be careful about whether we're talking about the protein, in which case you have very tight similarity, or the underlying genes, in this case RNA, which would be uh, more distinct. And so then there's a question about how much time would have to pass and how much, uh, if you were involved in an experiment, how much passaging, that is moving it from uh, one cell to the next, or one, you can also do this with living animals, from one animal to the next, would you have to do to get this level of sequence difference? So um, you want to unpack for us what you think. So you have RATG13, which is the strain that is revealed in 2020 by the Zhang Li lab. Mm -hmm. You have 4991, which is at some level the same strain we now know, although we don't really know what uh, RATG13 is because, am I correct, there is no physical sample of RATG13? Well, this is a good question, too. I mean, because they claim they resequenced the, the old fecal swab that they took from the, the bats in 2013. But, uh, and they claim they don't have the live virus, but they, they resequenced something. And so that something must be the, the, the sample they collected in 2013. And some people are, yeah, some people are skeptical at all that RATG13 even exists, that the sample exists, that they actually resequenced something. People are skeptical about that and think that maybe uh, they, you know, came up with the sequence in other ways, other creative ways. So let's just let's just be clear about this. We don't have any reason to believe one way or the other. What we yeah, do have and- is a physical sample, but it is entirely possible to take a sequence, let's say 4991 sequence, and to modify it without doing anything in a laboratory and enter a new sequence that has high analogy to 4991 into a database under a new name. So there's nothing that prevents this. This is on the honor system. People enter sequences and, you know, it's up to them to provide a reference sample or something. Um, And other than that, we are just simply uh, taking them at their word. So we don't know whether it's possible for, uh, it's possible that, RATG13 
didn't exist, that it's a, uh, a modification of a sequence that was um, created for a purpose. It's possible that the sample did exist and uh, they did uh, do away with it. They disposed of it and have only the, the text left. Um, but anyway, these are all open possibilities. And until we have a frank discussion coming out of that lab about what they did and didn't do, we just are in no position to know. Yeah, and even if they had originally sequenced it, they can then, you know, take that sequence, recreate the original virus, put it into some cell culture, do many experiments on it, and it will mutate. And then they can take the new mutated virus and resequence it and say, oh, no, here it is, is what we collected back in 2013. And you'd see, you know, many differences from the original sequence and as you said, it's just their word that uh, in 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 science, you know, people take just people at their word, and uh, normally nobody really has any incentive to lie, which you know, in the case of an investigation, might not be entirely correct. So, am I correct but, that uh, from the sequence that they have given us, that they could actually, even if there is no um, physical sample of this virus left in the lab or even in nature, let's say it had gone extinct. They could resurrect mm. that virus from the sequence alone. Current technology would allow yeah. them to take uh, the coat from a coronavirus and install a genome that they had effectively written from scratch. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. You, well, if you have the, the code, the sequence, you can just print the DNA, the DNA version of the RNA virus, that's what is normally done in viral reverse genetics. You print like seven fragments of the virus in the language of DNA. Then you stitch them together in your you know, cells of interest and create one, you know, one long DNA clone of the underlying RNA virus. And then you put it into a different cell culture, which turns DNA into RNA. And voila, you got a live virus just from, you know, essentially from a computer. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's it's done routinely, and it was just recently done with SARS two in two labs. In one Swiss lab, did it like in, in a month. Uh, in, uh, they uh, Texas, they put together SARS CoV two from the sequence alone. Yeah, yeah. They just download the Chinese sequence, order the DNA printed in Genzyme in the states, waited three weeks until they got you know it mailed back, and then within a week they. Uh, assembled the the live virus from the fragments that they got printed in the states, in Switzerland, and uh, you know the Galveston lab in Texas did pretty much the same thing. It's a terrifying uh, level so, of power. Well, yeah, that's I mean, biology and genetic engineering has been growing by leaps and bounds, and the things you can do today with genetics or life systems, yes, so you you have. Unlimited power to <laughs> to do bad things. I'd say. Yeah, we still don't know about the like the underlying mechanisms in, in many organisms, but we can muck around with them pretty pretty good. <laughs> yeah, we can we like, can composite them. We can take pieces from here and pieces from there. And in fact, that's one of the things that is very clear in in your uh, your review article that you wrote is that we now routinely composite viruses in order to find out how they will function once done. So the creation of chimeric viruses that, for example, have assets from one place and assets from another place, from two different ancestral strains, and then you can put them in an environment uh, and see how they infect the cells from a creature or the creature itself, and then you can passage them one generation to the next, either of cells or individuals, and you can basically guide them evolutionarily to become better and better at infecting whatever creature it is, and then you can discover how the sequence changed in order to make them better. So the fact that all of these things are now uh, happening in labs routinely, presumably usually um, with good intentions, with the intention of making us safer rather than jeopardizing us. It certainly could be weaponized and maybe is weaponized sometimes, but scientists are routinely doing these things in the interest of making humanity safer. But the technology involved in doing these experiments obviously carries a tremendous risk. You know, SARS-CoV-2 is bad. It's highly infectious and 
has a very long list of very dangerous symptoms, but it obviously uh, has a relatively low death rate per infection. That could be worse. And the ability for anybody to download a sequence and, with, you know, what would it cost to put together uh, a, a laboratory that was capable of taking, let's say, uh, SARS-CoV-2 from the sequence alone and creating a live infectious virus? Well, from scratch, uh, I guess it'd be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. That's a but, very low number I mean, given... given uh, For, for bad, bad actor, yeah. And yep. You can print the sequence for like a 30,000 base sequence, uh, about $30,000 if you order it from the States. If you do it in China, it's probably 10 times less. You can so, just I mean, simply... It's really you can order the sequence. Print. Yeah, yeah. You, you, I mean, there's so many CROs that, like companies that do custom, you know, DNA printing, uh, protein printing, if you need like an actual like peptide or protein. But yeah, any, any kind of biology work is now outsourced. Uh, there's so many providers and a lot of them in China because it's it's cheap or India. It's 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 a cheap commodity now, the creation of, of, of DNA or RNA if you need. But okay. actually, yeah, we we one thing we just briefly touched upon about the synthetic or uh, chimeric uh, viruses, and this is true about SARS-CoV-2, SARS-2. In precisely the, the RBM, the receptor binding motif that is uh, supposedly coming from the pangolin, not supposedly, it's, it's the closest uh, to the pangolin uh, strain and everything else is closest to R RATG13. So it's, if we're talking about a natural origin, we, we have to explain somehow how the, the two viruses recombined. And, of course, it can happen in nature, but it would take uh, a pangolin and a bat meeting, you know, at the same spot for because the virus to recombine it needs to be in the same cell. Like two different strains to recombine, they need to enter the same cell and you know start replicating there for for them to have a chance to 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 recombine. Uh, and and it's really unexplained at this point how this can happen between because pangolins and, and bats are not known to uh, can inhabit similar areas or uh, have any kind of parties <laughs> together. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not impossible, but it's also right. it's got to be considered ecologically highly unlikely. And right. you know, the other thing is bats um, the way bats roost creates large populations and the fact that they're small animals means that uh, effectively, you can have a large number of bats, but pangolins aren't like this. And so the number of individuals is low, which means the number of opportunities for an animal to be infected by two different strains that then get to combine is pretty low. Pangolin is just a, it's a suspicious uh, proposal as the intermediate um, host. Uh, so, you know, not impossible, but at some level, we ought to be obsessed with finding whatever the wild intermediate host is, because it will tell us an awful lot, and it will allow us to put this lab origin hypothesis to rest, if indeed it should be put to rest. Um, but one does not get the sense that this is a focus. Uh, and it, it really, it just, it, it needs to be. Yeah, for some reason, we don't see a, a huge effort in China to, to find this intermediate animal or to, to survey other Yunnan strains or maybe go back to that cave but I think we should really go back to the fridge in the Wuhan Institute and check the miners samples those four miners uh, that had SARS antibodies we should really try to extract the genome of underlying uh, SARS like virus that they had and I think that that would offer some clues to uh, as to what this uh, pandemic is Yep, I think that's a that's a that's a great point. Just to fill in the uh, what the problem is and why we're focused here, 
when you generate a phylogeny, that is a tree that tells you how closely related organisms are to each other. We've all seen these things, these bifurcating trees of, of animals or plants or whatever. You can do this with viruses too, of course. And the problem with SARS-CoV-2 is that it doesn't land in one place. If you sequence one part of its genome, or in fact most of its genome, it lands in one place closely uh, affini uh, affiliated with uh, the rhinolophus horseshoe bat virus. And if you sequence this other very important part, it comes out much closer to this pangolin version of the virus. So mm -hmm. not impossible the two would have come together, but very unlikely ecologically. And so really the question is, which is more likely? that some very unusual ecological event took place in some individual pangolin somewhere, um, or that a laboratory, in an attempt to create a virus that was highly infectious and therefore highly relevant to the study of human pandemics emerging from bats, uh, would have composited two viruses, thereby solving a problem for the virus that the virus would have a very difficult pro time solving on its own. In other words, the jump to humans would typically right. be a very short-lived jump. And if you were in a laboratory and you were worried about things jumping into humans, you might make that jump for it. You would composite two viruses. You would make a virus that had capabilities that no wild virus does in order to see what happens next. And if that thing escaped, it might be that we are living downstream of that terrible phenomenon. If it escaped from the lab, having been composited for the purpose of making it more infectious or interesting to them in some ways, then many of the phenomena that are so unusual that we are seeing, like the, uh, the very large range of symptoms that uh, COVID-19 produces might be the result of the compositing and the passaging of these viruses in a laboratory, which would have evolutionarily imbued the virus with special capabilities, especially if it was passaged in human cells, which is something that's done. You, you may have heard of HeLa cells, HeLa cells being cells from a particular, uh, Helen Lack was her name, a patient who died of cancer, and her cancer is now uh, a cell line that continues in many laboratories and is used for experiments to see how things interface with humans. So, you know, arguably, this cell lineage could have been used to passage viruses that had been composited, and then it would, uh, the viruses that uh, were then the result of this experiment would have new capacities that a human being wouldn't know to generate, but that over evolutionary time in the laboratory, the, the virus would have picked up. You know, could that explain the uh, incredible transmissibility of this virus? Possibly. Right, and we didn't even get to the furin site, which is uh, another uh, big surprise in a, a beta coronavirus, which you know isn't seen anywhere else uh, with anything close to like uh, less than sixty percent similarity. So let's like uh, closest... let's, ha let's have you spell this out. What is a right. furin site? Okay, so that's a, a cleavage site. Okay, let's step back for. The virus to infect a cell, it needs to attach to the ACE2 receptor. And then what needs to happen is uh, it's a two-step process. The, the spike protein needs to be kind of cut in two. And at, at the position it's cut, the, this is where the, the fusion peptide is uh, located that then starts attaching to the cell membrane and kind of invaginates the virus into the membrane and uh, starts the fusion process, the membrane fusion, to get inside the cell. And so for this fusion peptide to become activated, the spike needs to be cut at this uh, cleavage site. And a very efficient new cleavage site is found in SARS-2, uh, which can be cut by a uh, furin family of furin family of proteases that, that can recognize a specific sequence of four amino acids. All right, hold on. Um, I want to I I slow you down just so people get it. The, uh, uh, the cleaving peptide, the protein that does the cutting, is resident in the human cell. Am I correct? Right. Okay. Yes. So protease is mm -hmm. in the human cell. And then there is a sequence. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and out in the uh, extracellular matrix as well, it's actually in, both inside cells and outside cells. And some proteases are actually found on the membrane. 
Uh, and the furin side is a very efficient side to be cleaved because it can be cleaved by various families of these proteases. And this increases the viral tropism much greater than without the site. Okay, so again, I, I want to get, I wanna get it, this into, into understandable language. The right. human being is producing a protein. The purpose of this protein, what it does, is it cuts a particular uh, sequence that it finds, and it cuts in a particular right. way. It's like a, uh, a surgical instrument that looks only for one sequence and slices whenever it finds it. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know it's correct. You I know, know it's correct, you know but better than I do. I just uh, no, I, that's not true. I think we we know similarly. But um, so okay, so the virus by providing the sequence at which this existing protease already cuts takes mm -hmm. a quantum leap in its ability to infect human cells. Is that correct? And in right. fact, its ability to move between species. Am I correct about that too? Right. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's been shown that the addition of furin site greatly enhances the ability of a virus to infect different types of cells and cells from different animals, because now the virus isn't so dependent on the exact match of its kind of spike binding domain and the receptor, human receptor, but the actual fusion can happen to, to other cells where the attachment might not be as strong, uh, like just from a species standpoint. Okay. So, and these furin sites again, a sequence at which these human-made proteases slice. That furin site, where do we find it in uh, natural coronaviruses? Well, uh, in 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 at that particular spot, we don't really see. Uh, furin sites in uh, beta coronaviruses. I mean, it's it's a cleavage site, but it's cleaved by different proteases, not not as efficient for, like, at least in humans, as, as furin is. Uh, we see them in like alpha coronaviruses or other families of uh, coronaviruses, but uh, we know that the introduction of, of this furin site, just from previous experiments in culture and other viruses as well, and in influenza, that it greatly increases the uh, transmissibility and it expands the, the repertoire of, of a virus in terms of types of cells and types of animals it can infect. Okay, so uh, a furin site greatly enhances transmissibility, but now you've talked about alpha and beta coronaviruses. So where do we see furin sites and where don't we see them? We see them in, in alpha coronaviruses. We, what are alpha there's coronaviruses? There's one in MERS. What yes. are alpha coronaviruses? It's just a different family of. of um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get you to spell <laughs> out how unlikely it is that you that you would find this furin site in a horseshoe bat derived coronavirus uh, from the wild, based on what we see in viruses of that type uh, that we've encountered. Well, just by you know the phylogeny or surveillance of this beta coronavirus lineage having none of them having the furin site and this one the SARS-2 ha having one it's it's just statistically very unlikely to expect it to see there and moreover uh, I think when we uh, put them in cell culture uh, I think it tends to actually mutate away so uh, mm, very interesting it, in uh, cell culture what kind of cells uh, I, I think they saw it in uh, like Vero cells, the green monkey you know, kidney cell line. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I wasn't really <laughs> prepared to going this deep about uh, into like the actual experiments uh, on the furin site. Uh, but that's, that's it's right. just very unlikely to to see it in, in this type of coronavirus. And the fact that it seems that there is some kind of evolutionary, not evolutionary, uh, some kind of selection pressure against it in, in the uh, beta coronavirus lineage because of, you know, in, in maybe in, in bats, in, in horseshoe bats, that uh, beta coronaviruses normally are found that that furin site is actually, uh, you know, detrimental to the virus. So, so that's I'm, why. 
So if I can just translate this, probably there's a trade-off cost to having a furin site. Right. And so what happens is if you allow the thing to uh, evolve under natural circumstances or semi-natural circumstances, the furin site comes apart because some other priority is higher. Um, what we see in SARS-CoV-2 is a furin site that is not found in any of the uh, natural lineages that uh, you know, come from bats, for example. And so the question is, did something really unusual happen here that put that fern site either through an evolutionary mechanism or through a uh, hybridization event? Did a fern site get added to a virus that almost never has one when we find it? In fact, in the wild, never does have it. Or did a laboratory decide, well, one thing that we could study is what happens if there was a furin site um, that would create a virus that had capacities we haven't seen, and maybe we'd like to investigate those capacities. Or third possibility, you tell me if any of these are off the, off the map of, of actual possibilities. Third possibility is a passaging experiment generates a furin site because the conditions that are provided to the virus make it advantageous, and whatever the trade-off is is not prioritized by the laboratory environment. So fern site is, is short in sequence, am I correct? Yes, it's just four amino acids. Yeah, just yeah. Four amino acids, so that's uh, mm -hmm. a very short site. And so you could get mm -hmm. there through chimerism and you could get there through passaging. Am I right about that? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So the the question then is, is the highly unusual fact of a furin site showing up in this virus that is creating the COVID-19 pandemic the result of some natural event that is um, very unusual, or is it the result of laboratory manipulation, which would make uh, good sense if you were of a mindset to study uh, potentially emergent pandemic-causing viruses? Yeah, it's it's a big question and uh, unexplained at this point. And uh, uh, I think there's also one uh, interesting aspect of the of the site, the furin site, that I find interesting is that it the way it, it's constructed in the nucleotide code, it actually has a, a special uh, like a digestion enzyme site that could greatly help with screening for mutations in cell culture to screen if the furin site is actually mutated away or uh, on on the contrary to actually screen for colonies that still have it uh, the FAL1 the or FAL1 the restriction enzyme uh, site and the way it's uh, it's implemented the the uh, four amino acids that are coded for the first two uh, arginines are coded by uh, pretty unusual codons uh, that are in general found uh, quite rarely in, in the sequence. And, but they, what they do allow for is for this new restriction enzyme to be present in, in, the, kind of in the insert. And this is another thing that the furin site is not only interesting is that it's there, it's interesting in the way it occurred in the, in the SARS-2 uh, uh, sequence in the SARS-2 genome is that it's 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 in there by an insertion and it's insert of twelve nucleotides, whereas usually you know it's not unusual for viruses to develop these furin sites that didn't have them before, but usually it happens through mutations. Like the sequence length doesn't change. It's not like you see a magical appearance of twelve new nucleotides at the very spot that now has a furin site, which is what happened in SARS-2. Okay. So these two interesting, you know, uh, occurrences are, again, they're not proof of anything, but they're just uh, add to the bag of questions that uh, kind of weighing heavily on, on the tip of the scale. For they're very conspicuous when taken together. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, so you've got a fern site that shows up out of nowhere um, in a play in a virus that would typically not have one. You have the fact that the sequence is added rather than the result of mutations of the sequence that was present. 
that's also conspicuous. So that could be uh, evidence of a laboratory inserting this sequence rather than it resulting from a natural process. And then you point to flanking sequences that, I, if I understand you right, you're suggesting they could be used as a kind of indicator. Sometimes scientists will add something to a, uh, a modification so that they can detect whether the modification is present in a particular sample. And so in this case, if furin is something that would tend to evolve away um, as a result of a trade-off cost, you might want a little indicator to tell you whether it was still present. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not a, even the flank, flanking, it's actually inside of the insert. And the way the insert is done, the, the codons coding for it, the two arginines, enable this new uh, restriction uh, enzyme site to be there. And it could be used for, you know, R-flip, the like restriction length fragment polymorphism screening process to uh, very quickly, very efficiently see if y your colony of a virus has this furin site or it doesn't. So you can, if you want it to, to stay in the colony, you can screen the colonies that have it pretty efficiently without, you know, having to bother to resequence the, the whole thing. Uh, so when that's that's I mean it, all of it could be uh, a result of just uh, occurring naturally, but it's just as you said, taking together all those co coincidences just add up to the point where you start you know being somewhat suspicious about this being uh, handmade rather than you know evolutionary selected for. And another point I I want to make is that the lab leak doesn't necessarily mean handmade it could also mean like everything that happens in nature can happen in the lab especially given that the lab is the place where all of these pangolins and bats all are brought together or even maybe you know they're put in the same culture maybe inadvertently and so just be, like some uh, virologists say that it they think it's a process of natural selection that that is at work here well natural selection can work in a lab you know just in uh, holding pens for, I don't know, bats, which the Wuhan CDC had live bats to extract virus samples from. I don't know if they had pangolins, but they had pangolins, live pangolins in Guangdong and the Wildlife Refuge Center, where the Chinese customs sent the smuggled pangolins to. Uh, so just because, you know, some, some virologists think that all the hallmarks that we see in the virus, like what Anderson and others are claiming, they think they sh are much more likely to occur through natural selection. Again, that doesn't preclude a lab leak. Natural selection can be uh, at work in, in a lab without even the scientists knowing it. They can just, you know, have some infected bats and infected pangolins. And it's actually uh, much higher uh, odds of happening in a lab than in some remote location in Yunnan or Malaysia where the pangolins normally live. And even if it does happen there, it still doesn't explain how this materializes in Wuhan without managing to infect anyone along the way, Yeah, which is a big question. So it's funny you mentioned this issue of evolution taking place in the lab without scientists knowing about it, because of course, <laughs> uh, one of the ways that people know about me at this point has to do with my discovery uh, or my prediction hypothesis that made a prediction that the long telomeres that we see in uh, laboratory mice are actually not indicative of the nature of mice generally, but are indicative of a kind of evolutionary pressure that exists in the breeding colonies that nobody had recognized. And so we now know that this is right, and that those, those telomeres were elongated by selection in the laboratory or in the breeding colony. And, of course, that was not the intent of the people who were breeding these mice. In fact, they weren't even aware that they were exerting a strong selective pressure, but it was enough to radically elongate the telomeres. So this kind of thing happens all the time. And in this case, it's particularly dangerous because if this virus was passaged in the lab uh, under conditions that were special, in other words, uh, if it was passaged in human cancer cells, well, cancers have particular idiosyncrasies, and any particular cancer that you would choose would have idiosyncrasies. And those idiosyncrasies would have a lot to say, potentially, about the way the virus functions. Um, also, you point out the issue of evolving away. To the extent that 
this virus might have been passaged and favored to adapt to certain cells, that might be giving us advantages at the moment. Like, for example, the uh, difficult time the virus has transmitting itself outdoors well, the laboratory is an indoor environment. It's possible that something was selected for that made it particularly transmissible indoors and it did so at cost, at expense to it as, uh, in terms of how transmissible it is outdoors. And what's going to happen then is over time, it's going to become more transmissible outdoors. So I don't know if that story is right or not. I mean, we don't know if this came from the lab or it didn't. But if it did, and that has had effects on its nature as a virus then not knowing that is going to cause us to make the problem worse. Because to the extent that right now we have a virus that um, we can interact outside and not transmit it to each other, we would be very wise to act carefully so that it does not learn the trick of being transmitted outside. And if we're casual about outside, it will evolve in that direction. So uh, one thing I really hope people get from our discussion is that this is not a question of blame. This is not a question of who cares, it's now a human pandemic and let's deal with it. This is a matter that has very important implications for the pandemic that we are facing, how long we will face it, how many people will die. If it is a wild derived virus, we need to know that. And the way we're gonna find that out is we're gonna settle this by finding a population of some other creature, an intermediate host in the wild. Um, but that's going to require transparency with respect to what went on in this lab in Wuhan. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know if we're going to get it. <laughs> I mean, well, they hold all the cards and unless there's immense international pressure. I, or I don't, I don't agree. Or there's some kind of whistleblower. Well, yeah, so whistleblower would be great. I would love yeah. to see a whistleblower. But, Yuri, you have no idea, I think, how important an effect you are having on this story. Right? We saw... Me? Matt, yeah, you. <laughs> I hope not too, not too important for... I, I, know, I know that for whatever reason... Some people want to get rid of me. <laughs> for, well, oh, yes, you're not important. Hello. Um, yes, Yuri is completely unimportant, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. Just ignore him. But if we were to put that aside, uh, Matt Ridley published in the Washington Post this week uh, mm -hmm. an article right. pointing out what you have been saying. And in fact, you know, he... Uh, well, it wasn't just me. <laughs> it's just, I mean, a lot of people were um, saying, oh, and many of them way longer, I mean, way prior to, to my article. And it's good that there are people who are not afraid to speak out. And I, I, yeah, I agree. Let's hope there's more and more. <laughs> But, uh, well, again, I, you know, I don't want to put you in danger by um, pointing out the, <laughs> I, the centrality of your work. But I think a lot of people have had the same reaction to it that I have, which is that, uh, you know, we go looking for evidence and we find that a lot of the evidence is compromised by people who do have such a conspiratorial bent that they are basically verifying their, their own beliefs rather than doing uh, uh, an honest, careful uh, job of sorting the evidence that goes in both directions. What I saw in your work and what I expect Matt Ridley saw in your work and what others who I know have cited you, uh, you know, I saw another one in the, uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists today investigating this question. It also cites you. So your um, clear self-skepticism, your desire to do this honestly you and I share a desire to actually be wrong in this case. It would be much better if this did not know. come from the lab. <laughs> I don't want to be right. <laughs> I don't want to be right either. But I, if we are right that this is a, the most likely explanation, I'll speak for myself, I believe it to be the most likely explanation at this point. Um, if we are on the right track there, then it is urgent that the virology community stop telling us a fiction and that they come clean with what they know and they understand. And I think in order for that to happen, it is incumbent on us to be clear that let's say the worst is true. Let's say that this virus was created in the lab, that it was the result of uh, a chimeric virus that was then passaged through human cells and that this explains something about the way it behaves uh, now that it's escaped into the human population. Um, that does not mean that this is Chinese in origin, 
the scientific community was engaged in these experiments. Yes, this most likely would have come from the the lab in Wuhan, but that lab was involved in international discussions. The granting agencies include the NIH. So um, this is this is a global problem. We we share responsibility for it. And the most important thing is that in an effort not to take responsibility that we don't bury the evidence of what the virus is because that evidence is essential for us figuring out how to deal with it, which is obviously, to any reasonable person, the most important question on the table. Absolutely. And the second most important question, I think, is the nature of gain of function studies and the, you know, should they be, like, what's the benefit and should they be maybe reconsidered and another moratorium on global moratorium on, on them should be maybe in place at least for a few years until we sort out, you know, what are the benefits that humanity is ga gaining from the, these kind of studies? Yep. Because what humanity was promised originally that they would, those studies would help prevent pandemics that would provide vaccines and treatments to, uh, uh, viruses poised for emergence to take the headline of one of the studies. Those promises have come up empty and we're nowhere, I don't think, closer to uh, any treatment or vaccine from, from those studies than we were before they were conducted. Again, I, I might be a little uh, biased here, but uh, uh, so far I just don't have any I don't know of any conclusive evidence for vaccines or or treatments that have come out of studies, not just on coronaviruses, even uh, influenza, the, the, the first H5N1 uh, gain of function experiment. I don't see it having you know, provided the world with anything of great value. Well, the risks, the risks of, of, of these studies, even if this one wasn't a lab leak, just in general, the risks of, of gain of function studies is huge with, I think, unjustified uh, benefits. So this this is a second topic. Yes. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I agree with this. And I think there's a third one, too. So the first one is, what do we do about the circulating SARS-CoV-2 virus, which depends in part on figuring out what it is adapted for, which might be a laboratory environment? Um, the second question is, what do we do about gain-of-function research going forward in light of the danger? Even if this wasn't a lab leak, we now are suddenly aware of all of the things that are going on in a lab and that, that it is plausible that this pandemic emerged from a lab uh, tells us that this is, uh, a, this is a major global concern and we need to figure out what to do. And then I would say the third thing on that list is the fact that this work is now possible, even if we have a scientific moratorium, does not prevent somebody from taking over that research. Even if we stop doing it in the scientific community, what stops some uh, uh, country that is interested in changing its ranking in the world power structure or uh, a malevolent organization that wished to use it uh, to its own ends. And, uh, you know, I will say it's not even difficult to figure out a perfectly amoral entity, somebody who just really didn't care about other people, um, could use this technology to greatly increase their own power and wealth. And it's not hard to figure out how they would do it. So um, we have a, a problem. We have now generated the technology to do things which having been generated and shared publicly discussed in the literature are now available to people that do not share our values and that is a big concern yeah and that's it's a tough one i mean is bioterrorism as it was a very tough question <laughs> i think have become a much more uh, uh, urgent cause of concern after some bad actors that were probably not you know bright enough to to see the potential of bioterrorism after this pandemic they probably could have woken up to 
Whoa, yeah. And you don't even need a lab now. All you can, all you need to do is collect some samples from, I don't know, or maybe steal samples from labs or just uh, samples of even, you know, even this virus and release it strategically in places where people don't expect it, so, I don't know, church or subway system or something. And yeah, you can just wreak havoc on economies of, of countries that you would you know, like to see go down. Well, you could... It's, it's a big problem. You could do that. And I, I also, uh, just as a mental exercise, I was, you know, early on in the discussion of could this have come from a lab? Could it be a bioweapon and all that? There was lots of discussion about whether or not this virus would make any sense as a weapon. And I agree that if your purpose was... Uh, military effectively, this virus is not a particularly good choice because so many people are asymptomatic. But that does not have to be what was on people's minds. And I really hesitate to put this idea into the world, but my feeling is it's so obvious that my being quiet about it doesn't help. So probably better that we are all uh, sobered up and aware of this. The um, If one decided to create such a virus and release it, one could pretty reliably guess that it was going to have a negative impact on, let's say, air travel, hotels, um, uh, cruises, these kinds of things. And obviously, the nature of markets are such that if you can predict when nobody else can that these particular industries are about to take a huge hit, um, you can take small amounts of money and turn it into large amounts of money or take large amounts of money and turn it into gargantuan quality, quantities of money um, for just simply being able to predict what others don't see coming. And that fact means that motive here could be utterly mundane. Now, again, there is no evidence that this was intentionally released by anybody, and I think you and I are both believers that... Um, the most probable explanation is uh, well-intentioned research that uh, resulted in a leak nobody foresaw. But I have to say, one other possibility, again, zero evidence for it, but it has to be on the list of things that could explain the phenomena that we see, is that if somebody did create the virus, Wuhan would be the kind of place you would want to release it in order to hide your tracks, right? Because if it's released right. in Wuhan, then the obvious, you know, the obvious uh, interpretation is that the laboratories in Wuhan, and there are two of them that study bat coronaviruses, that one of them uh, made an error. But yeah, it would probably have to be a, a huge inside job for them to know that Wuhan would have the RATG strain uh, re really, you know, setting up Wuhan Institute. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the SARS-2 is so close to the strain that the Wuhan Institute had. So. Well, so I, I agree with your logic, assuming RATG 13 is what we think it is. Um, and would you say that the similarity to 4991, similarity to 4991 is sufficient that somebody would have had to have, um, they would have had to have lots of information about what was going on. So it's unlikely that some malevolent force, it's not impossible that somebody would release a, bat like coronavirus in Wuhan in order to hide their tracks, but the chances that they would get something so close to RATG 13 and 4991 is pretty low. I mean, it's not impossible, but it would be someone with really deep knowledge of what Wuhan Institute was doing. So, I mean, probably if an actor of, of that caliber was contemplating something like this, that they, they, do a lot of the homework and okay. I mean, it's, well, that's, it's, it's a possibility. It's look, a very, very remote possibility. I, it's, it's a remote possibility. There's no evidence for it, but I think actually we're modeling something that I want to see people be better about, which is uh, conspiracies exist I mean, in the world. It's a huge concern going forward. Yeah, it's a huge as, concern going forward. And we have to learn how to talk about the possibility without being labeled crazy for engaging and even considering it. And so, you know, what you've just seen is two people who know something about this story and the relevant scientific details. And, um, you know, I think we're both pretty skeptical that 
this has unfolded now, but we're worried that it could unfold in the future. Yes, I hope <laughs> we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hope we're wrong too. And I hope that, it, yeah, best possible from my perspective, uh, and I'm sure I speak for you here, is this comes from the wild through some uh, unusual, hard to imagine series of ecological events that we are capable of discovering and figuring out. Um, so the lab isn't at fault. They can be exonerated and we can sober up on the basis that we've been now through this exercise and learned the lessons that it has to teach us and we can figure out what we should think about gain of function research and we should think about what the heck we're going to do about the amazing power that malevolent forces now have at their disposal um, at ever lower price points right and there were there would always have almost have to be some kind of really broad surveillance of new viral outbreaks or just outbreaks uh, throughout the world where ne there needs to be some kind of like one big agency like there's a nuclear agency uh monitoring like the possible bioterrorism and if there is a cluster of similar infections you know in one one geography just really trying to sequence quickly what is the agent behind this and hopefully you know not let it get out the way that this one got out and i gotta say like even without any conspiracy theories or lab leak the way it was handled by wuhan a government or a chinese government just not imposing a lockdown soon enough and letting people celebrate the chinese new year and, and intermingle and leave the country i mean that alone is 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 pretty uh disappointing and in the future we we really need like really quickly isolate geographies where outbreaks happen so that we can avoid global pandemic on uh, like the scale is completely crazy that this is and i'm afraid we're just beginning to see the numbers just you know start growing even further in in, in other uh continents other countries like now africa and, and south america reporting uh, high growth so i'm afraid we're not there yet to to see this play out to see this pandemic play out so. yeah i share i share those uh those fears with you and i do feel like as bad as this is this is the ultimate trial run this is the thing that sobers you up and you know i hope there's also a willingness to consider the general style of problem because i know that over the last gosh what it would it be um 2008 financial crisis 2011 fukushima Elizo canyon in i don't know what was that 2017 18 Anyway, we keep having this situation where we discover what some industry is doing after it is too late. When some, oh, the Deepwater Horizon uh, accident in the Gulf of Mexico. So I, I constantly feel like I'm learning what I needed to know after the accident has already happened. And that what I really want is somebody to fast forward that process so I can know all of the processes that we're engaged in that are unbelievably dangerous. Um, so that we can talk about them ahead of time rather than uh, once the, the cat's out of the bag. Um, and, you know, this may be the worst of these in terms of the destruction, uh, economic and human, that ultimately comes out of it. And frankly, even if this thing evolves into something with flu-like levels of hazard um, that humanity is stuck with, even that would be a major setback. I mean, we have flu circulating every year. That's a big problem for humans. To have a second one of those, if that's what this turned into, would be a huge disaster going forward. So um, we are and playing with fire. Go ahead. Yeah, we're not even sure about the long-term consequences of this. It's only been six months that we've kind of known this virus. We don't know if it can hide and become a chronic infection like the feline peritonitis, which is also a coronavirus that can actually learn to hide in, in the immune cells and 
then it just becomes fatal in like 10% of, of the infected cats. I hope this is not going to be the case with, with this one. Yeah. But it's, you know, not out of the realm of possibility that, you know, there could be long-term bad consequences that we're just not even, you know, aware of. The, totally. Unknown, unknown in the words of Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> You're quoting Donald Rumsfeld. I love that. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, for what it's worth, he- Heather and I are constantly <laughs> quoting that guy. Um, you know, he's like uh, the Yogi Berra of uh, geopolitical phenomena or something. Um, but... Uh, I agree with you. This thing could hide in neurological tissue. It could hide in immunological tissue. Um, it could be. It could learn to change at a rate that would allow individuals to be reinfected multiple times over a lifetime. We just don't know what we're playing with here. And right, um, and the male re- reproductive system. They already had issues with the first SARS, where you know autopsies saw uh, like infected. Uh, gonads and you know um, there were reports in China with male fertility issues of, of people after having had this SARS-2 so yeah it's just uh, I don't want to like scare people but I'm, I'm pretty scared myself that like long term this can be a, a bad a bad one yeah not I, like, I agree not like flu I mean flu is bad enough but like chronic flu hiding inside that yeah would be that worst possible scenario I, f- I find myself in these conversations all the time, too, uh, where people are, I mean, in, in my country, people have been convinced by uh, our president, amongst others, to treat this as more trivial than it is. And I keep trying to alert people that just the size of uh, the unknowns here, the magnitude of them is so great that um, yeah. we are wise to be treating this very seriously. Yeah, at this point, if if anybody is still unconvinced that this is much more serious than the flu, I, I think that they're living under a rock. But initially, we all kind of were uh, just based on the previous track record of other viruses, other outbreaks, even coronaviruses. I mean, SARS and MERS were pretty bad, but like comparatively, it was just a few thousand people. Yeah, that, they that burned were out. Sick and, yeah, exactly, and that's what we thought. You know, our Many people thought, I, me included, in the beginning, that oh, it's just another, you know, something seasonal from China that we get every year, and it just usually subsides pretty quickly. And it's, it's exactly a deal. It's exactly what I thought too. It was I, I but, remembered yeah. SARS, and I thought, okay, that's bad, but yeah, limited. Well, but boy, were we wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's that <is> quite right. <laughs> So let me ask you uh, uh, two more questions. One, sure. um, your experience since releasing your medium piece. Well, it <laughs> uh, wasn't very pleasant. I mean, there's a lot of positive feedback, but the share of the negative feedback I got, especially initially in Russia, uh, it was uh, very vicious. Uh, just you know, for some reason, people started attacking me personally. Yeah, you know, questioning my, you know, intelligence or whatever the qualifications of being able to, I don't know what, read scientific papers or whatever that had really nothing to do with whatever facts I presented. I mean, I I su- suggested initially for everybody just to read with a skeptical mind and analyze for themselves. Just don't, I mean, I don't really put a lot of uh, uh, my own views out in the article. I just pretty much summarize the facts. Of course, I mean, I color it with, with my views, but you know, you can do your own analysis. And if you think I made a mistake, just you can point out the mistakes rather than say I'm an idiot or I'm a conspiracy nut. And, well, that's not really um, what they're saying. Um, as somebody with considerable experience with uh, things in this neighborhood, what they were trying to do was make you hurt to dissuade you from continuing and to make an example of you so that others would know not to make the error in their view that you made. But the error that you made was doing an honest analysis and sharing what you discovered with the public. So my sense is uh, 
we needed you to do that. And uh, I know that it, as much as I was already quite suspicious, it um, gave me a tremendous boost in terms of understanding exactly uh, what the suspicions were rationally based on and how to follow the trail into a realm. You know, I'm not... uh, Biotech, cellular biology was never my primary interest. So just having somebody guide me into the literature that was relevant to this, since I didn't know anything about what was taking place with coronavirus research, that was all new to me. So uh, what you did needed to be done, which is exactly why you were punished for it. Um, That said... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, yes. And I mean, if whoever wanted to reach the goal of making me feel unpleasant, they, they did so. But uh, the initial kind of fecal, fecal storm subsided. And after that, <laughs> I got mostly positive feedback of people saying that it did open their eyes to at least the scale of gain-of-function research that has been going on in the virology community and the danger that itself poses, even if the, the lab leak theory is, is to them still uh, highly unlikely. The fact that there's so much dangerous research around and still goes on, to them that was a revelation. And in parallel, some some scientists have uh, reached out and said that uh, they, you know, support the definitely support the idea that we cannot rule out the lab leak at this point, and that it should be considered uh, like on on an equal basis with any other hypothesis, uh, as opposed to. Some people, some are all just claiming this is sheer lunacy and conspiracy theories. Yeah. Well, so I've uh, been suggesting to my audience that conspiracy theory is a stigma, a term that's loaded with stigma designed for a purpose. Uh, Conspiracy hypothesis is really what we're talking about. Yes, it does appear at the very least that there is a uh, conspiracy to prevent us from investigating what happened here. In other words, the unnatural um, alignment of virologists with each other around a story that doesn't stand up, that does appear to be a kind of collusion. Now, um, there's also other evidence. Uh, How's your computer? (laughs) It's okay now. It's okay now. What happened? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know. I think it might have been hacked. It just started doing really weird things and not connecting to the internet. Which I just... You've had computer problems. Pro- probably malware. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't want to claim it, it's connected, but some well, other people... I agree. ...had some other computer issues at the same time. Computers are... Kind are of looking. Computers are complex. Things go wrong with them. You never know. I've had computer tr- problems, too, of late. Um, it's pretty dramatic, in fact. Uh, could be nothing. You know of anybody else who's been uh, courageously investigating this hypothesis who might have had some trouble? I know at least one person, yes. <laughs> All right. So th- take that for, for what it's worth. People have computer. I mean, look, there's nobody who's watching this podcast who doesn't have a computer. They screw up, right? Things happen. On the other hand, there does come a point at which your problems are severe enough, mysterious enough, and form a kind of pattern with other people who are also uh, using their computers to uh, discuss and investigate possibilities that obviously uh, powerful forces don't want discussed. And you just simply have to ask the question, are are my computer glitches uh, normal, or is what seems like an anomalous rate of computer errors telling me something about the um, level of disturbance that I have caused in the universe. Right. So if maybe other researchers who have been working on the lab leak hypothesis had some kind of computer problems or any other weird things happen in their lives, maybe they can share it and we can uh, put together some kind of list of (laughs) unexplained coincidences outside of the lab leak hypothesis yep. to people trying to investigate. I think it's well worth considering. All right. Is there anything that you think we've missed that needs to be on the table for people to understand the landscape they've landed in? Well, 
I mean, I think we already said way too much for for anybody to uh, get their head across at this at this point. Um, we discussed a lot of things, but I think we've touched upon all the main points of this huge coincidence with a lot of unanswered questions, and I just hope they're answered. You know, I just hope somehow someone pressures the scientists uh, or not even just answered but we need access to the lab we need to you know the what a who whoever needs to uh, check the environment or we'd like to see the samples collected from those miners and we would like to sequence and we'd like to independently sequence the RATG sample to just verify that you know everything that the Wuhan Institute was telling us is Indeed, the facts. What do you think about uh, the idea that for the good of humanity, we ought to be uh, offering uh, immunity to scientists who were involved in legitimate scientific research, not weapons research, but legitimate scientific research into uh, potentially human infecting viruses? If this turns out to be a leak, would you be uh, in favor of uh, them being assuming that they uh, were being honorable, that they be immunized from liability? Definitely. And, and, and even, you know, in my article, I say, even if a, a leak occurred, it, the scientists, they're not to blame because they haven't been, you know, engaged in anything illegal or out of even, you know, well, weapons research is a bit of a gray area, but it, it's not illegal for countries to engage in it. The States and you know China and Russia have all been engaged in weapons research. The thing is, like, if it escaped and there's been a cover-up, the people who are doing the cover-up, they're the ones who do face, who should face some, uh, I don't know, ramifications. But what I think we really need to establish is some kind of incentive for whistleblowers to be able to blow the whistle safely with immunity and uh, witness protection and big financial incentive to do so. Yep. And so far I haven't seen anything even remotely of the sort from governments, which, you know, a little odd considering, you know, initially I thought, you know, the American government stance was that, you know, it's going to demand a full investigation, but it's not really providing financial incentive for whistleblowers blowers to help out. And so one of the things I suggest, suggested maybe, you know, half jokingly is that maybe the community can crowd found, crowdfund something like this or create a crowdfunding hotline, tip hotline for coronavirus origins research where we can have some completely anonymous system of rewarding whistleblowers or, you know, people offering actionable tips with cryptocurrency uh, we just need some you know donors or crowdfunding to collect i don't know a bit of a purse to to be able to offer these rewards for like meaningful amounts for people to be kind of risking their oh. their livelihood i think this is a great idea and the idea of doing it with the uh, cryptocurrency is a wonderful idea too it'd be a tremendous proof of concept uh about how cryptocurrency could um, function to the benefit of humanity. Um, right, it could be completely anonymous. And, and that, that's one of the usually problems of uh, uh, like financial incentives. Yep. For, like if somebody really is in China and he wants to, or she wants to alert the US authorities and, and be compensated for it, it'd be really hard to do and, and not, you know, get in trouble in, in China. But if you're doing it all online through cryptocurrency, which is, you know, all anonymous and untraceable, I think that even if it's not crowdfunding, I think, you know, the American uh, intelligence agencies should should set up some kind of system like that. Just otherwise the risks for people in China to, to blow the whistle, I think are just too great for them to do so. But if they're, you know, can earn some money in a very safe way, I think they'd be much more inclined to do so. And yep. it's not not necessarily just the scientists who who might like who were working on this who might know something. It's probably like they had friends, family, uh, who can offer you know substantive tips on 
what to look at and maybe who who to question for investigation to move forward. So, yeah. but I don't know. It's just, uh, just let's just that... let's just say um, humanity has an overarching uh, need to know um, what took place in order to manage what we now are encountering. And that suggests we should pull out all the stops with respect to liberating people to tell us what they know. And, you know, people who have the capacity to do something that would aid in that effort know who they are, and they may be more creative than you and I are in a position to be. Maybe they can figure out some way to make it happen, but let's figure out where this thing came from. And if it's nature, uh, you and I will... Oh, this does point something out. If it is nature that this came from, uh, you and I will be relieved to discover it, and we'll be happy to do a follow-up podcast and talk about um, what what the meaning of what we've learned is, and if it came from the lab, let's figure that out. Um, last thing before you go, I wanted to talk about, uh, I have increasingly noticed in, in looking at all of the sources that claim to put the idea of a lab leak to rest, I find the name Peter Dashik, is that right? I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> this name shows right. up all over the place. Um, he's everywhere well, that the idea is mocked. And he is the, see, the president of Eco Alliance, whatever Eco Alliance may be. Oh, he's the founder, and yes. Um, I have Force come. Go ahead. Behind it, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's the, the main guy who's been doing this for many years. And very publicly and very large amounts of money. <laughs> is it like dozens of millions of dollars in grant fun financing from various sources from NIH to Department of Defense. Uh, just funding research of essentially going out to remote places in nature and collecting <laughs> all sorts of dangerous pathogens and bringing them to <laughs> one spot to uh, analyze and, and predict the potential danger of, of them spilling over to humans, which in itself is, I think is a pretty futile exercise to, to be able to uh, claim that we can somehow predict what in nature can, you know, out of the gazillion possibilities which mutation will actually jump out from nature to 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 the human domain just because you know I, usually what happens in nature stays in nature but <laughs> when we actually start going out and, and and probing what you know bats are carry in, in remote places and, and actually bring them all together in one spot like in, in Wuhan or whatever we're increasing the chances of it actually happening. Well, I think and, I think uh, there's a very simple comparison to be made, right? In general, these things do not jump to humans. The ones that right. can jump no to No matter what Peter claims, and he's making some very odd claims of like, oh, in Asia it happens every day and there's millions of people exposed to zoonotic jumps. And he's making a huge, huge jump from like extrapolation from just six far farmers in Yunnan that had antibodies, six out of like 280, six farmers having antibodies for a related uh, coronavirus that can't even infect human cells. He, so he takes us 3% and extrapolate it to like all the farmers in, in Southeast Asia. And he's saying all oh, those millions of farmers every year that get exposed to bad coronaviruses, which is yeah, I take because... I take exactly the opposite message, which is the jumps when they happen burn themselves out quickly because the things that have jumped are not well adapted to humans in general, which doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but it does mean that we can compare what is the risk of a jump happening that we didn't know anything about ahead of time and that if we had known about the risk ahead of time, we could have prepared, Right. So that's the upside of this research. And then there's the downside, which is what are the chances that you are going to trigger the accidental release of something terrible by doing this research, Absolutely. which is clearly high. And so anyway, I have come to regard this individual. And every time I see his name show up, the information does not check out 
And there's this very strong implication that those who even consider this hypothesis are telling us just how naive and underinformed they are, which does not match the information. If you pursue the information, his assurance of this is always wrong. So I have begun to regard him as patient zero for misinformation. Well, yeah, I mean, he's really fighting for his life, so he really doesn't have any other way to defend himself. And if if this does turn out to be a lab leak, I mean, the ramifications for him personally, I, I think just too horrible for him to consider to even entertain the slightest idea uh, of possible possibility of a lab escape. I think you I think you're being I think you're being too generous. The misinformation is too egregious and the fact is any decent human being would recognize that humanity's overarching interest in knowing what took place overrides his interest in uh, maintaining his reputation. Frankly, I think the world would end up being decent to a scientist who had made an honest error that had some role to play in this thing emerging, but uh, I have very little sympathy for somebody who would hide the truth at expense to others. I mean, people are dying. This is, this is not a joke. This is not uh, something where you get to defend your career uh, at the expense of um, tens of thousands of other human beings. Yeah, and, and one other point being that it's not that they just went out and collected so many viral strains is that they actually had a whole program of synthetic, creating synthetic chimeras to kind of expand the panel of possible, first of all, to predict possible mutations in the wild for some reason that, again, as I said, very naive to predict, like out of gazillion natural possibilities, which of them can happen uh, in nature to predict them in the lab, to create them in the lab, and, and then say that we need to prepare for those. Uh, and yeah, in the latest interview, like bef just before the, or actually in the middle of the pandemic in December, he, he gave an interview in December of 2019 uh, at some virology conference where he was saying that they had like a hundred different strains uh, that they were working on and how easy it is, easy, easy it is to manipulate coronaviruses where you can just, you know, snap out an RBM and put, put one back in and uh, have like different tropism between the virus so you can study like a more efficient vaccine. And that was actually the kind of the overarching theme of, of virology research of the past few years to create a pan-coronavirus therapy or pan-coronavirus vaccine. Whereas, so they actually needed to provide uh, as, as wide a, a panel of coronaviruses as possible. And this is actually uh, mentioned in the article by Rav Barrick. It's mentioned in the grant for EcoHealth that uh, Wuhan Institute was part of, that they have a mission to create you know, many new viral strains against which they can test potential therapies or vaccines, which of course, you know, we haven't, haven't really gotten in time for this pandemic, but that's a different question. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, that's a... I think it's a proper a proper note to end on. Um, I hope that we will discover things in the coming weeks that will uh, lead us to revise um, our our best understanding of what likely has taken place here. But I'm very uh, grateful to you for doing the work you've done to unearth the evidence of a lab leak hypothesis. I. Uh, regard it not only as important work, but uh, I regard you as courageous for having done it. And uh, it troubles me that people have tried to make you feel bad about doing it. I hope that um, <laughs> well, it's ultimately right. it's the you internet <laughs> you get to hear a lot of <laughs> unpleasant things on the internet. So. There are some unpleasant things on the internet. I wonder why they put them there. Um, yeah. All right. Well. Uh, Yuri Dagan. Well, thank you for, for, yes, you know, making this uh, much more widespread knowledge than it probably would have been without your work and, and continuing to try to, you know, make people realize that, uh, you know, this is very important and this is an important matter and we really need 
political support to, to get to the bottom of this. Because, you know, if it's just a bunch of people complaining on Twitter, nobody's going to be pressured into having a thorough investigation. But if it's actually a lot of people being vocal and making their politicians uh, heard and, and making them know that we want, you know, we want the truth, we can handle it. Yep. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll get to the point of, you know, having a really in, independent and true investigation into this. That would or be great. Or whistleblowers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one way or the other, we need to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, I hope we do get there someday. Okay. Pretty soon. Um, I will put a link to your Medium article, which I think you have added to a couple times. You've made little uh, edits that you have highlighted so people will know what was in the original and what you've added. Is that correct? Yeah, I added initially just when I uh, released it. There were a couple of points that came out. And yeah, I, I put like uh, updated. I haven't really updated it since. That's yep. probably been the same uh, for almost a month now or even more. Well, I consider it uh, the uh, hallmark of an honest actor is that, you know, of course you release something as... Uh, uh, hello? Sp sp hello? You still there? Oh. Oops. I think we got some hackers. Oh, <laughs> no. All right. Well, fortunately, we got it all. Are you able to hear me now? No, nope. can't hear me. We're, we're done. <laughs> All right. I guess we're done. Maybe now they're yeah. disconnected. All right. Um, anyway, uh, thanks so much, Yuri. And uh, I'd love to have you back to give us an update when there's something to talk about. Be well. <laughs>